Great. Before I go, I'd like to just reiterate, we're celebrating five years of Civic Tech Toronto by bringing you an exciting panel of people that are part of our community. Um, for the panel, you'll be in the hands of our panel moderator, Emily McRae. Emily's been organizing Civic Tech for at least a year, if not more, and we've been we all respect and admire her thoughtfulness, attention to detail, as well as her cheerfulness and consideration for others. We couldn't think of anyone better to moderate tonight's panel. I, it's possible that somebody like that exists, but we haven't found them. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Emily. Thanks, Curtis. All of the uh, waves during the intro portion gave me a big boost of energy. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from others tonight. Uh, just to give everyone an idea of what to expect for the next portion of this event. Uh, I am about to introduce our amazing speakers and uh, they will each have some time to provide some opening remarks. After that, uh, the structure is much more fluid. We're inviting all of you to ask questions and the way we are doing that is through the Zoom chat. So if you have a question for the panel, please uh, write it out and put it in the Zoom chat. And we are gonna pull from that to uh, ask questions and continue to shape the conversation. So I'm thrilled to be able to introduce our speakers tonight. Um, first up, we have Jennifer Hollett, Executive Director at The Walrus, known for its award-winning independent journalism, fact-checking and ideas focused. She's also a longtime friend of Civic Tech Toronto, hosting Hack Nights while working with Twitter Canada and at the Atkinson Foundation. Um, in those roles, she supported the civic tech community with not just space, but food. Um, definitely above and beyond the pre-pandemic standard of Tuesday night pizza. Next up, we have Nasa Ahmed, technologist and community organizer who works at the intersections of social justice, technology, and policy. She's spoken at past Civic Tech Hack Nights about her work with the Digital Justice Lab, an initiative focused on building a more just and equitable digital future. She also spoke at the last in-person event that I attended, and I know um, many others here were also there, Code for Canada's first ever summit back in March. And then last but not least, we've got Delini Karupala, a public servant and passionate volunteer with Civic Tech Toronto since 2018. She founded and leads a civic tech project that supports youth in transitional housing with tech skills mentoring as pathways to education and employment. And she plays an ongoing role as a co-organizer, including helping to make tonight's event possible. So um, to kick it off with our panelists, we've got a broad uh, question to start, uh, hoping to hear about how your work intersects with Civic Tech Toronto and where you see civic tech going based on your experiences. Um, John, I'm going to ask you to start. Sure. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. And I feel in many ways, it's very fitting that we're all together through technology, right? So that's, to me, kind of the, the point of Civic Tech Toronto on how we can, can build community and, and come together and work together, powered by new technology. Uh, so I've had a non-linear career. When I went to journalism school back in 1994, one of the first things I did was get an email address. And this was at a time when the internet didn't even have graphics. And really the only way to have an email address back then is you had to really be into the stuff. I got a boyfriend, he was really into the stuff. So, you know, he had his dial up and he, he was all in the community or like through the universities, right? To have an email address and to be able to search for research. By the time I graduated in 1997, the internet was coming of age. We had, you know, the early beginnings of, of Amazon. Uh, in my case, I got a job working in the music industry. I was doing online content and later marketing for artists like Celine Dion. I actually answered her emails <laughs> for quite some time. Uh, but uh, early on, like, I didn't think that this was going to be a career path for me, or I, I, I don't think I even realized like how it would change anything. But I was drawn to any form of technology that became available to me because it just seemed to make things easier when it came to connecting with people and, and communicating. And uh, it has changed everything. And uh, I was really fortunate to be part of tech in the early days. Uh, 
first our, our team was called consumer technology, then we were called new media, and then MP3s came on the scene. So I had a, a front row seat to an industry that was completely transformed and fought it and fought it. Uh, I then moved on to media, another industry <laughs> that has become completely transformed by tech and has also fought it and worked as a broadcast journalist, a TV host, a reporter for CTV, uh, then Much Music and Chum, and later CBC. I decided to go back to school. I did my Master's of Public Administration at Harvard. And while at Harvard, took one class at MIT uh, and created something called Super PAC app, which in the 2012 U uh, US election was like Shazam, except you would hold up our app to political ads and it would offer fact-checking and more information on the money behind those ads. And while working on Super PAC app, my co-founder was from um, MIT, so we based ourselves uh, at MIT, uh, the Media Lab in, in the Beehive, which was a startup incubator out of the business school. And that's where I first attended a hackathon. And I have to say, at first I was a little intimidated because, I mean, I have some basic HTML skills, but that's about it. Um, but but that, that is a stereotype. I felt very welcomed to this hackathon and discovered that at, at a true hack night or hackathon event that a wide range of skills um, are, are necessary to compete. And our group won, which was really exciting. So I won a competition at my first hackathon. Uh, I ended up coming back to uh, Toronto in, in 2013 and building on my work uh, in, in tech and in journalism, I got more involved in, in politics. I worked on Olivia Chow's campaign as a digital director. I ran for office myself in the 2015 federal election. Uh, and then I, I checked it. I was at Civic Tech's Hack Night number 36 uh, and was invited to speak about my work with Super PAC app. And um, how I come into this is I feel like all these different things I've done throughout my career, I would later go on to work with Atkinson Foundation, I was head of news and government, Twitter Canada. Now I'm back in the media as the executive director as Walrus. That to me is what civic tech is all about. It's taking a diversity of, of people, interests and skills, and it's saying, come together and we wanna create a better city. And we believe that is possible. And to me, the beauty in it is my experience when it's come to both activism and public engagement is in traditional town halls hosted by, say, the city, the same people come out, right? It's kind of like the same people, certain demographic, usually, uh, not always, but usually white, older, uh, and, and a lot of people when you try to engage them, they're like, that sounds really boring. And it can be very boring. Whereas civic tech, uh, I, I think is a very exciting offer. And I think that we have learned in COVID-19 that we're all working in tech. So we, if you're getting any work done, uh, unless you're an essential worker and, and big thank you to you if you are, you're probably working thanks to Zoom and Slack and Google Meet and other technologies that are connecting us in this work. So I think that for me is you know, one of the benefits is as we come out of COVID-19 in the months, maybe next year, and we think about what type of world we wanna live in, is that we value technology and its ability to bring people together and think of a new and better world in that way. And that is my hope for the future of Civic Tech Toronto, that we continue to invite and welcome people who might be intimidated by the idea of like a hack night or wondering if they have anything to contribute uh, and for them to come in and, and realize, wow, like everyone is welcome. Uh, we love the new ideas and we're just beginning, right? Technology is very much evolving and it's dependent on our, our creativity and, and thinking what's possible. And we better be using it to create a better world. Uh, otherwise, what's the point? Thanks, Jennifer. Really appreciate going all the way back to the beginnings of email and MP3. Gives us some good context. Um, Nasa, do you wanna go next? Let me unmute myself. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, congratulations on five years of weekly hack nights. Like, awesome job all across the board. Um, and as I was thinking through like my relationship to civic technology, I realized that's actually the way that I entered into the tech sphere, which I didn't. I, at the time, I think they called it community tech, um, but in the U.S., like, and specifically in the U.S., they called it like a different 
area called the community technology and that was my entry point was folks actually building like text tools like cms text tools for like labor workers and migrant workers in california and that was like my entry to it before that my relationship to technology was just as a user um who is obviously like still perplexed by the technology because it, all my relationships were shifting because of it but like you know being able to bring in my politics um into the work and understanding the power dynamics and all of that really started from community technology and having activists who were also technical right and who were trying to build new tools were trying to build interesting tools um and that was my like entry point into like i guess i'd enter into this tech sphere i had no idea because at the time i was interested in immigration policy and that's what i was going to do i was going to work uh, like the government and just going into immigration policy and everything kind of shifted this one summer in Detroit where I met all these folks who were working in community technology. Um, and the work just continued on, you know, for me, my first, like, you know, my first job in tech was funny enough working at a health tech company that was all former political staffers. <laughs> Uh, so it was my entry point also in that regards of working in a corporation, but also all former political staffers um, and kind of seeing the impact of technology um, specifically around modernization and, you know, why I think I entered into the space was I, I think this was quite naive of me as when I was younger, but I was like, wow, like, you know, there's lots of work happening here, but you know, the issues aren't as old as like the other issues that I've been dealing with in the past. So I was like, maybe there's an entry point in regards to being able to shift things, um, you know, in regards to building foundations. Obviously, I, I would say right now that was quite naive of me because as we know, technology in many cases, yes, it does make our lives better, but there are a lot of cons that come with it and also, you know, an exacerbation of like the issues that exist in our physical reality. So even though I thought I was like running away from some other issue, that was not the case. I was, well, I was I was, I was heading into another cave, <laughs> um, a deep, deep hole, but a deep hole with wonderful faces and wonderful folks who are just trying to figure out, you know, with the constant advancement of technology, how do we focus on people, right? How do we focus on residents? How do we focus on the needs that are not constantly grounded in just efficiencies, right? Um, that are grounded in how we connect with each other, how we work together. And so I think that you know civic tech has become an opening for a lot of folks who may not traditionally be in technology or actually be interested you know off the top right they kind of see themselves as separate from the work they don't have the technical skills or they may not just like see technology as the way we a lot of us see it um and i think that Civic Tech has been a place for a lot of folks to have that, you know, beautiful foundation, right? To have an understanding of what it means to um, build sometimes the tools that, you know, our cities can't build, but we need. Um, building alternatives to the tools that we use, but may actually be extractive, right? And so I think that that has been really beautiful to see over the years of how people have been able to kind of take their curiosity and run with it, right? run with it, which also includes the good, the bad, the ugly, right? And that is part of the experimentation, right? We're constantly experimenting. And so I think as we move forward in our understanding of like civic technology and the spaces that we're creating, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone's in that space, but like I'm constantly quite, I've been questioning my career beforehand. I'm questioning it every day as you're working in technology um, and what my role is, right? What is the impact? Are we actually working towards a better future? Are we just making small changes? This is where I get into a philosophical rant of what the world is gonna look like. But um, I think that this is actually gonna be so important for voices like this, like all of you who have been participating and understanding the dynamics of technology and community, technology with public engagement, technology in civic life, it's going to be more important for folks who have that interdisciplinary understanding of the world to participate in the reshaping of what we're in right now, because there is still a lot, like a lack of literacy, a lack of understanding, and I don't think that always comes from a place of malice, right? And so I think that is going to be a really cool space for a lot of folks to enter is like, what are the 
critical questions that we have to continue to ask, right? What are the worlds we want to be creating and what can be created with technology and what cannot, right? And what are our like, you know, absolute no's as we move forward. And I think that has become stronger and stronger, um, you know, through the years as people have, you know, participated in civic technology, whether it be on a volunteer basis or as it's been kind of, you know, in, it has immersed into digital government and all the different forms of um, the ways that technology has entered into kind of like the public service space. And so what I think like moving forward is that I think civic tech has created that space for those questions. I think those questions are going to continue to be asked. And I think that it's going to be more important for those voices to participate in. I think what we're going to see is a transformation of the city, right? And we're going to see constant transformation, um, especially because of COVID and the rising concerns of housing inequality and coming quality, etc. And so, um, you know, how do we ensure that the technology moving forward is for the people? How do we ensure that, um, you know, we are fighting back against techno solutionism at, at, at every point because austerity measures are going to increase? And I think a lot of that conversation, that critical conversation can happen in places like civic tech. So um, I'm excited to see how it moves forward um, and excited to participate in any way any way that I can. And I'm going to finish with a kind of a final kind of thought. Um, I've been reading a lot of June Jordan, who's an amazing poet. And if you actually look into June Jordan, she was also, they kind of viewed her also as an architect. Uh, she did a lot of collaborations with architects in regards to reimagining what Harlem could look like. So definitely check her out. She has this one um, letter that she wrote for her, to her friend. And she said, I have no simple answers, but perhaps our willingness to listen and to say all that we know and feel all that we dare perhaps will help us to build something better than we can even now imagine. So I think about that when we're trying to explore the tech, explore our society, explore what's possible and what the future of civic tech can look like. Asana, thanks for bringing poetry into this conversation. So essential for imagining our, imagining our futures. Um, next up, Delini, for some opening remarks. Hi everyone, uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here on the panel with uh, Jennifer and Nazma. Um, and there's so many worthy panelists from our CTTO community, so I'm so honored to have this opportunity. Um, just a little bit about myself, just so you understand uh, where my perspectives are coming from. Uh, like I said, I'm one of the co-organizers of uh, Civic Tech uh, Toronto. Uh, and I've also been leading a civic tech uh, project, um, you know, with this community for the past two years. Um, we used to be called the Accelerator Project, but we recently rebranded to uh, Toronto Tech Mentoring. Uh, and the goal of our project is to uh, empower individuals, um, uh, achieve their professional and uh, professional goals um, and also democratize tech uh, to some of our community's most vulnerable communities. Um, I, and I'm speaking in vague terms here, but really our, our focus is on uh, those who are underhoused uh, and in transitional housing. Um, and this is just one of the several in, uh, volunteer initiatives that I'm a part of. Uh, I'm also on the board of a mental health uh, nonprofit. Uh, I'm part of a maker space, which uh, has very different, uh, which has a very different community. Um, and I'm also uh, a policy professional working with the Ontario Public Service. So what I've learned through my various experiences um, is that every institution and every community has its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, to me, the civic tech community really has the strength of having a, a passionate and dedicated community that has kept CTTO going for the past five years. Um, one of the things though that has stumped me ever since I joined uh, is what is civic tech exactly? Um, and you know, within our decks, when we do our presentations uh, every Tuesday, uh, we go through a broad scope of what this could be, uh, and uh, and some of the definitions are along the lines of anything that intersects with technology, uh, you know, for the public good. Um, and I think in many ways that fluidity is um, is a strength because it it means that our community is so large. Um, and uh, you know, there's so many uh, people within our community. But I also think it 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 also um, has kept us a bit stagnant. Um, and I think we've been a little bit hesitant to define who we are and what our values are. 
Um, and to me, there's uh, every day there is new meetups and new uh, new communities that are emerging uh, that are uh, you know very defined. So I think we can do a little bit more to you know be courageous uh, within this year uh, and really define who we are and what our values are within the broader landscape of uh, civic tech initiatives and initiatives for the public good. So thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Delaney. And I hope you'll draw on your experiences with other board work and maker spaces because I know um, you do so much. Um, so those are our three uh, speakers for this evening. And now that we know a little bit about our panelists, we're also hoping to find out a little bit more about who is uh, joining us in the audience today. So I believe we have a poll that should be popping up on your screens via Zoom. And uh, yeah, as you can hopefully see, we want to know um, how have you been engaging with Civic Tech? Is this your first time? Um, do you come often? Have you not been in a year? Uh, so please do vote. Many of us are big fans of data, and so we'll have some data to share from this little experiment. And also, uh, once you have voted, please throw any questions that you have for the speakers based on their remarks so far into the chat. And we're gonna use those, speak those questions to uh, continue this conversation. I see we've got uh, 57 votes so far. Welcome to everyone who is here for the first time. This is a deep dive into what civic tech is and what civic tech could be. Um, let's give the poll a few more moments so we can watch those bars move around. And uh, panelists, I'm just going to give you a heads up. The next question is kind of about how does Civic Tech Toronto fit into this city? Um, where do you see it working? But also, where do you think Civic Tech could uh, better engage with the communities and the realities of Toronto? So hopefully by now, everyone who wants to has uh, added to the poll and back to the panelists to talk about um, where does Civic Tech Toronto fit into the city? Who would like to start? That's Mike, can I throw it to you? Yeah, you can throw it to me. Um, where does it fit in the city? In regards to the ecosystem, I would say that it plays two roles. I think it plays like the public education role in many cases, right? It provides a space for folks to learn, to engage, to bring their ideas. And so I think that's one area that Civic Tech Toronto has played a pretty massive role across the board. Um, I also think it plays a role in, I don't think it, I'm not sure if this is always intentional, but it actually, I, I've noticed it's happened where um, also pushing the realms of like what is possible for the city, right? Like being able to critically assess like the tools that have been provided by the city and also like pushing back or adding to, um, which I think that part of that is I think intentional from what I've seen, but also, also unintentional of like being able to do that kind of like larger scale analysis of like the things that are happening and what is procured by the city. Um, what it can do moving forward. I remember actually the last time, this is the wildest thing, but the last time I've talked, last time I talked at um, Civic Tech Toronto was actually the summer, well, they call every summer the summer of violence, but it was about two summers ago and it was actually when Shot Spotter was introduced. Um, and I actually remember feeling, um, a lot of feeling a lot of ways about about that because I had folks who were impacted that summer, you know, people who had died that I knew and people were, you know, friends of friends. And so, you know, and Shot Spotter was kind of the solution that came out of, of that, right? It was a, you know, the $3 million solution at the time. And I remember kind of feeling um, almost not surprised in any way, shape, or form, shape or form because, you know, ShotSpotter had at the time, by the way, contact ShotSpotter, you place it in a community, it listens to gunshots, locates it, records for about four seconds after. You can obviously assume where, what communities that would be placed in, um, and it's a way of being able to, like, quickly locate, right, the, the shooting. And when that happened, I, you know, I wasn't surprised, obviously, because at the time, ShotSpotter was actually quite popular in the U.S., and 
Hill. So they've been lobbying pretty hardcore in Toronto. And so that wasn't surprising. But I think I was confused at that point who plays a role in the advocacy side of things, right? So in other cities, there are other, like, you know, in Oakland and in New York, there are, um, or, you know, civic tech groups that actually do also do the advocacy part, right? Digital Justice Lab doesn't do advocacy, and that's, that hasn't been our role, you know, yet. Um, but I was just curious, like, where does, where do you go, right? Like, where do you go when this is technically, like, a technology is being procured by a city and then also supposed to provide benefit, um, quote unquote, obviously it had been paused, it's officially paused now. And so, you know, I think that that's where potentially civic tech Toronto could move. And that's something that's just more of my interests as we're thinking through the changes that are happening um, in the city and many times changes that are happening very quietly, right? That aren't necessarily like, you know, analyzed on a larger scale because, you know, the understanding of the topic area or whatever the case might be. Um, and so that's where I think it there is a possibility. And I don't just think it's on civic tech Toronto, right? Like I even think about that for the role for digital justice lab all the time I'm like is this a time to become you know an advocacy organization or what is it right and so but I think that there is a space there um, to actually push back uh, against uh, procurement that the city is participating in right that actually could be extremely harmful um, and but that's a hard role that's also the thing right it's not easy to figure out when do you fight back and when do you all that good stuff um, and that's why advocacy is really hard and so but I think that there is room there because you know, we're, as I said, I think the city is going to change quite a lot moving forward. And I think that there's going to be a lot of technology solutions coming through. And so what is the role of entities that have an understanding of the technology, right, or have an understanding of like the role it could possibly play, and, you know, have maybe sometimes a stronger analysis, right? Um, what is what is the role of that in supporting larger scale communities in moving forward, right, and being able to assess what's, you know, okay, not okay, or not necessarily what's okay and not okay but more of like what's actually beneficial and not beneficial you know so I think that's a hard that's a hard place to hold though so I'm not saying that everyone has to do that but I think it is a hard place to possibly hold thank you um Jen or Delaney anything you'd like to add there yeah, I can uh, jump in over here. So I think I have a little bit of a different perspective from, from NASMA, and this is kind of drawing from my experience uh, uh, trying to pursue projects within CTTO before starting my own, as well as kind of working as a public servant. So uh, I, I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, pursuing advocacy. I think that there could be some, uh, some roles for CTTO uh, to, to support advocacy and influencing the government. Um, but to me, uh, a lot of the conversations around civic tech in the past have um, been around engagement uh, with Torontonians and its government. Uh, whereas I feel like the opportunities are really in uh, how Torontonians engage and connect with each other. Um, and the reason why I say that uh, is uh, my experience um, on a previous project within CTTO, uh, I think we can call it uh, a learning experience because <laughs> it was not successful, but um, it was uh, called Base Count and basically uh, it was trying to address um, a technology uh, issue uh, at the city level uh, and basically we were trying to uh, produce uh, a product with uh, with the government um, as a customer in mind. Uh, and I think that's really, really challenging uh, for the civic tech community to, to pursue that avenue um, because there's so much about government that is, uh, you know, uh, like knowledge that the, the, the broader community doesn't necessarily have access to. Um, I think it requires a, a really good understanding of how government works, how procurement works. Um, and I just, I, I personally don't feel like that's where a lot of the, the strengths within our uh, membership uh, lies. I really feel like uh, a lot of the strengths that people bring um, are passion and, you know, they're very mission oriented. So definitely some roles in advocacy, but I also think, you know, the ability to bring people to uh, and connect with each other. So on the accelerator, one of the things that we're doing is reaching out directly to the community, working directly with nonprofits and, and working with uh, 
uh, with, uh, you know, the, the homeless and underhoused population directly. Um, and we're using technology to, to help support that, but we're also trying to democratize with technology so that they can, uh, you know, build tools that uh, they can use to support themselves and, um, you know, help alleviate poverty. So, you know, I really feel like I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant personally, and that's just my, my personal view um, on uh, tools that are directly uh, between government, uh, between the community and engagement with, with government or government as a customer. Great, good to hear. Um, Jennifer, thoughts? Yeah, so I, I appreciate, Delini, what you were saying earlier on like, what is civic tech? Toronto exactly, right? Like even answering that question for this community. And for me, reading what's in chat, reflecting on my involvement in, in this community and similar communities, it really is a space, a dedicated space, like you know where and when, and if it's a global pandemic, that's fine, we're meeting on Zoom. Uh, for people who are interested, passionate, curious about tech and, and public, good and tech broad, public good broad to come together. And when we come together, there's an opportunity to create, to play, to experiment, to network, to fail, to connect, but to, to take an idea and say, who's with me, meet in that corner, right? Like who wants to do this? And I, I think the ultimate success is not just five years, but five years volunteer run. I mean, I don't know about you, but in the old world, when I try to get three people together to go see a movie, it's just about impossible. It's like, what about this date? Well, I'm booked. What about in three weeks? Well, I can't. Like, it's hard enough to see people you like or are related to and make that happen, let alone this with strangers. So to me, that is the big success. I think the ultimate challenge though, and you know, I, I found this when I was running for office uh, federally and when I attempted to in 2018 before Bill 5, is that when you talk about tech as it relates to government, even when you talk about like that, people have no idea what you're talking about. And then when you call it civic tech or Gov 2. Point, like people are just like, what? But they know the issues, right? If you're like, the rent's too damn high, they're like, yeah, totally, right? Or, or if you talk about policing and you know, defunding, like people are like, oh yeah, people have, but often when you bring in like this idea of, of, of civ civic tech, um, it, still people are like, so I think there's a lot of work that, that we can do um, connecting tech to this area of people's lives because I think people know all the stuff that's happening here and that they're addicted to it <laughs> and it, how it has improved in, in some cases maybe not improved their their lives um, and then there's a larger challenge too when it comes to anything civic you know the average person if you say who's your city councillor like unless they're really engaged they might get the name wrong they might name their MPP or M MP um, some people are following U.S. politics more closely than Canadian politics, especially right now. So I do think we're, we're navigating uh, some pieces here that require further education or engagement. You know, maybe instead of asking people to come to us, we go to people in the spaces where they are. And that's something I think about a lot in government and, and politics. Like if we're going to say, hey, we're meeting here, it's always going to attract a limited group. Whereas if we can go into spaces, and I know some folks do that into schools, workplaces, et cetera. Uh, and that's part of the design of going into different places and having guest speakers. Because I do love watching people come together where it's like, oh, this like random citizen who's shown up is now having a conversation from, with someone from the city, right? Or like someone who works in tech and wants to do good. is like, where can I use my skills? And this is a place. Thank you. Um, that question of sort of what civic tech is or what it means is a huge one. So again, I'm going to open it up to everyone who's here and invite you to use the um, chat and really challenge you, like if you could describe civic tech in one word, what would that word be? Maybe type it out in cap locks, just so as we're all scrolling through the chat, it's very clear. Um, but I'm certainly excited to see what people come up with. And uh, based on our previous poll for everyone who was able to participate, it looks like we've got more than 20 folks who are out here for the first time, which is really exciting in terms of bringing um, new energy to this community. Um, also, based on what the panelists were just saying, I was really curious about this idea of civic tech as an opportunity to fail, which I think Delaney and Jennifer both mentioned, and uh, wondering if any of the three of you just want to build on that. Yeah, I'm happy to, to start that. 
obviously there's some discussion right now on creating a culture of failing and failing fast. Like you'll hear a lot of media discussions and podcasts on it, but I think in, in most of our lives, whether it's our professional lives or personal lives, we absolutely don't want to fail. Like that's an embarrassing, right? And there's great risk to failing. You know, it could be your income. It could be, you know, respect from your peer group. Um, stakes are, stakes are pretty high. Uh, we're in a space that is run by volunteers, where you have people of all different skill sets, um, introverts, extroverts, like there is an opportunity to say, I have an idea, who would like to come and, and meet in my corner? I mean, I've been to some hack nights where it's like one person and no one joins that person's corner, right? Like one person's like, I'll meet, and, and that person's like, that's okay. And then next week they're like, okay, I'm gonna put it out there again. Maybe these are some new people and then two people join. And so, but, so there's an opportunity, I think, to like throw an idea out there, see if it has movement, Maybe you meet three times and it doesn't go anywhere. And then maybe in three months you bring it back with like more feedback and a focused idea. Um, but I've always found that Civic Tech Toronto goes to a, a great distance and I've seen it tonight to work on establishing a, a safe space and, and, and creating a culture where people feel welcomed. And I think when that trust is, is built, if you try something and it doesn't turn into something that is funded by a grant or like something that you can hold, no one's going like, mm, like we're not talking about tonight on like, oh, that idea that never happened. We're like all these great ideas that people tried and that led to that and then we learned that. Um, there's not a lot of spaces where you can truly do that. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, I would echo uh, Jen's comments. I think failure can be seen in a couple of different ways. Like to me, it's about an opportunity to grow. It's, it's um, you know, an opportunity to experiment. Um, and that is a great, uh, you know, space for civic tech. I personally have, you know, used that approach in my own projects. Um, and, you know, there really isn't a, a guidebook for how to make a civic tech project happen, for example. You know, that is a very unique uh, thing to be doing to run a completely volunteer project, to, to have a day job that's completely different um, and parse out enough time where you're providing, you know, leadership uh, on a particular project and motivating a community of people uh, to donate their time to a cause, right? That is quite unique. Um, so I think, you know, I've, quite, I've experimented uh, quite a lot with that. Um, and I think it's a great thing uh, that has contributed to my own personal growth and my professional growth. Um, I think that where failure becomes a problem in civic tech is when it leads to things like burnout. So if there's repeated instances of failure um, or, you know, if people have invested so much time in a, in a particular project and, uh, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, sometimes it's hard to cope with that. And, you know, it, it does lead to a little bit of burnout and, and, and a feeling of what did we really accomplish here? Um, so I think, you know, there's... I think a certain level of uh, experimentation and uh, failure is okay. Uh, I also think that we have an opportunity to uh, to provide, you know, guidance and capture some of the lessons learned that everyone has gone through. Because <laughs> I think everyone gets to a certain uh, space where, whether you're within, uh, you know, the the project space and and working on a project, or whether you're an organizer, um, where you know we can we can use some of the things that uh, previous. Uh, organizers and uh, you know uh, members have learned uh, so that we're not we're not you know fall you know we're not failing in the same areas um, and we can continue to like develop our community so that it's not like I said earlier in my opening remarks not stagnant. For sure. Uh, Nasma, anything you want to add? Um. No, I feel like the responses were solid in regards to failure and constantly experimenting. And that's where like, you know, Hack Night plays a big role and mm -hmm. um, in being able to explore your options. I think that once again, this also then ties back to what Jennifer was saying of like, okay, what does it mean to go to the community and then not just like create things in your own silos, which I think mm -hmm. has always been the difficulty around civic technology that's also even stopped me from participating in certain ways, right? If I'm going to be completely honest. And so I'm mm -hmm. um, not just like in the Toronto context, but even outside of Toronto and so um, yeah I think that like 
creating that room for failure. And I think that one of the biggest things is like learnings, right? Like I think that people are in constantly, constantly in, in a space of learning, expanding, changing. And I think that creating that, creating that environment weekly is what allows people to expand, right? Um, and change their ideas, you know, build a foundation, whatever the case might be. Absolutely. Um, lots of words going up in all caps and otherwise in the chat. Uh, mashup, imagination, sharing. I think one of the words that comes to mind for me in terms of what civic tech is, I would type in all caps process. I think that was definitely like even a theme that came up as we were planning this event and it comes up on an ongoing basis at organizing meetings. So I don't know, um, I'd be really curious to hear uh, what the three of you think about sort of the role of process in community-based technology and what can it do, what can't it do, um, what role does process play? I can I can start off in answering that. Um, so uh, I think we all have a love hate relationship with process, but I think that process plays a significant role in community based technology, whether it be our increased understanding of the possibilities or when you're even building a tool. Uh, like how you bring people in, what is your intention, your goals, how, like, what are the processes that you're going to be able to use to deal with like different learning styles and, you know, different working styles. Um, you know, I think it's important also to just provide context in this, in this conversation is that, you know, I haven't been an active member in the civic tech Toronto space, but have done community-based technology projects outside of it. And, you know, one of the biggest pieces, I think, for the process is always around intent, right? Like intent, purpose, um, and who is, who is working, like, who are you working for, right? And actually co-collaborating with. Um, so I say working for, because in many cases, like in my context, like I'm working with a community, but I would say like my my role is to support them in you know, getting to the final destination, whether that destination be an app, whether that destination be expanded understanding, whatever that destination needs to be for their purpose. And so I think that like process in the really early, I think that's where the early day conversations around intent to goals and what's actually possible, but also um, are we replicating some issues here? Are we not dealing with the core problem <laughs> at hand? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if most people know this, but like a lot of my job for the first couple of years when I was working in technology was telling nonprofits to not build the technology. So that was like a good chunk of my job <laughs> saying, hey, we don't need to build that tech. Um, and so you know, purpose, intent is actually like the most important. And then also how do you how do you play a role a role in co like actually collaborating because there is a power dynamic especially when you understand the technology right or if you're building the t if you're the one building the technology um and so that's been something that i constantly think about in how we build and move forward and i'm trying to even think through like not necessarily even saying collaboration but like co-conspirators right which is you know a concept in like you know black radical thought of like what does it mean for like both like we all have kind of the equal goal like equal goals like we're all moving towards the same destination and there's like really trying to level out that you know there always will be power dynamics but leveling it out in some way shape or form so that we all feel like a sense of deep connection to the project and also like the role that project has moving forward so um that actually i think is the biggest legwork beyond the actual doing like, you know what I mean? Like, I think like that's the hard part is like figuring out all those pieces and then the doing, you know, you'll project management your way out of that. But I feel like, you know, it's just like that, the, the values, the intent, like that is the biggest part of the process and the hardest conversations to have. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I've really learned in the civic tech space at, at large, I definitely see it with Civic Tech Toronto and the Hack Nights is the importance of, of transparency. Uh, and, and also, uh, I, I've seen a few words and, you know, um, sharing, the spirit of, of sharing. You know, I think li living and, and being a part of this capitalist system, most of us have jobs where it's like, there's this scarcity and, you, you know, you're protecting your work and you're just like, here it is. And, um, you, you know, it's IP and, and, and the opposite, I think, is civic tech, which is creating something together, explaining how you're doing it, 
uh, you know, asking the question, is this going to be open source? That's often the spirit of many projects that, that I've seen. Um, if something does fail, handing it over to someone else who wants to, to try it. Um, and I think by showing and sharing your work, that invites more people into the space. Uh, tech is really intimidating. Like I've noticed even when, when people do have tech skills, they'll say like, ah, this is not a space I feel welcome in. I'm not a techie. You know, I don't have the education that some of you do or, or if people don't fit this like stereotype that we're fed over and over again from the media, uh, which is male, it's white, I would say it's younger, it's very nerdy, it's this like trope uh, that people, even if they have the skills, think that, that they don't belong. Whereas if we create a space where we show our work and, and how we do it, there's learning in, in that process. But also, I love that larger international community of civic techs around the world, right? Where if someone has a good project uh, and it's open source, that that can be shared, um, or even the model, right? That if someone was to say, oh, we want to do a Civic Tech Niagara, um, that we'd be like, cool, this is, what, this is what we've done, this is what works, like, feel free to use it. That, that's a very different uh, approach than a lot, of, a lot of the culture you'll find, say, in, in a startup environment. Absolutely. Um, Jelena, anything you want to add? Uh, just very short um, and maybe sums up uh, some of the things that Nazma and Jennifer are alluding to. I really think that process, uh, you know, should follow our values and our objectives. And it, it, it helps us to uh, achieve objectives or to uh, achieve our values. It shouldn't be for the sake of having process, right? So if we're using that lens, um, to me, the word process means nothing. I really should be more focused on, you know, what are we trying to achieve? How are we trying to do it? Um, Jennifer alluded to transparency as something really key and important. Um, you know, th that's a value. So I think, you know, we really need to define to me uh, within civic tech what our values are and then develop a process that follows suit. Thanks, definitely. Um, we've got a really active chat, so thank you to everyone who is uh, writing their thoughts down and sharing them in that format. Uh, one of the questions that has filtered out from there, I'm going to uh, ask you all now. So does the neutrality or nonpartisan nature of Civic Tech Toronto discourage certain communities or people from participating? What are your thoughts? I'm a partisan, so I would love to hear someone else answer first. I am also a partisan. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we all are. I'm happy to start. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like, you know, we, ha we have to pick, right? There's, there's strengths to uh, doing a nonpartisan route, which we, I think we try to do, but uh, inherently we have certain values and that's how we make decisions. Otherwise, there wouldn't we wouldn't get anywhere, um, you know, in the selection of speakers, in uh, the selection of who's here today. Like every every decision is supported by some inherent values that you're perpetuating. It's impossible to be completely nonpartisan. Um, so I I think you know, to me, like we ha we should be deliberate about it. We should uh, we should take a poll of who's here, take stock of what the underlying values are and, and be deliber deliberate about who this community is and what our values are. Because I think the danger of not doing that is you're actually uh, disengaging people who might be uh, you know, connected to certain values when you say that everything is accepted. And I don't think that's actually true. I don't think everything is accepted here. We have a code of conduct. There's some underlying values there. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't tolerate harassment. We don't tolerate any form of discrimination. If we are about uh, you know, have, showing each other respect. Those are all values. And I don't think that's something that, you know, everyone in society shares. So I think we should be deliberate about that. I think that was on mute. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that I think this is one of the one of the hard hard issues that civic tech has had to deal with not just Toronto but I think across the board in the movement of 
nonpartisan, but then tech is inherently political, right? Um, our solutions are inherently political. What we deem a solution to a problem, what we even identify as the problem, right, is inherently connected to our values and what we want to see for our communities, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you might have a political affiliation in any way, shape, or form, but the values that you might have, I think, is super important. And I think that's also, I think, a struggle that I, I, I think I've personally had in some cases, but then I, I also think this is also an interesting part of then the changing nature of civic tech through different leadership to the, like not just in Toronto, but just generally of like people always recognizing, right, that this is like nothing can be neutral, like there's no such thing as neutrality um in any of the things that we do like no matter how many times we attempt to <laughs> find neutrality in it there isn't um and so that's once again like do you are you and this is something that you have to obviously decide and have probably have had conversations about over the years that i've not been privy to but like how how upfront are you about what those values are, right? And I think um, that's always gonna be super important because it ties to then the projects you end up having, the type of solutions you wanna provide, right? And how it connects to a deeper issue. Uh, because I think that like right now, like in this, I know people keep saying in this moment, but like in this moment, um, you know, a lot, I was talking to a friend the other day and you know, a lot of the issues that we view is like, a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now, even with like the technology creating issues, first of all, but also like the technology that I might say the technology I'm talking about apps, talking about a variety of things, but the technology, the issues that they're creating, the like technology is creating on top of the techno solutionism side of things. Like we know what the core issues are, right? In many cases, right? It's housing, it's decent work. It is like racism, you know, like there's, it's white supremacy. It's all of these factors that a lot of the issues that we're dealing with right now, even when it comes to the tech side of things, like we, pro we might be dealing with a different type of issue, right? Right? Um, if we weren't uh, talking about the inherent problems that we're experiencing. And so, yeah, I don't think anything um, is neutral. And I think that the solutions that we want to create and what civic tech, even as like, as we define civic tech, right? Like if it's for, if we're thinking about community, what does that look like, right? And, um, and what do we want to see moving forward is going to be super important for us to have like value, like very strong values about what that, what that means in the work. Um, yeah, because as I said, nothing is inherently neutral, no matter how much we try. Yeah, and, and, and I think I'll also just say values again, similar to like the moment we're in it, it is, it, it's all about values. And I think that a lot of us who are part of the civic tech movement are, are partisan in some way or another. And I also think a lot of us are partisan in nonpartisan roles, like, so you can also exist with that duality. Uh, and this work does involve the government of the day. Yeah. And there's the government of the day at the municipal level, in our case, the provincial level and the federal level. And I think we'd probably all agree that we still wanna work with the government of the day because the government of the day is gonna be in power from a year and a half it's a, or two, if it's a minority government to four years to eight years. Uh, and uh, I think obviously being so close to the border and being greatly influenced by the U.S. Um, I can only imagine what this conversation would look, look like in, in the U.S. right now. You know, maybe sometimes there is a tipping point when people are like, enough is enough and, and you know, people are dying because that, these are the conversations that's happening in the U.S. right now. But uh, I, I think this should be an ongoing conversation and it comes back to, uh, you know, what role does advocacy play in, in this work? And I think what we're seeing right now is, you know, in the time of, of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, is that there are a lot of groups that normally aren't part of advocacy who are saying like enough is enough, like we are gonna release a statement or we, we are gonna be proactively more involved in calling the government to do this or making a donation and supporting this group. And I, I, I think those conversations need to continue happening. What I really respect about Civic Tech Toronto and Civic Tech at large is it's not static, right? Mm -hmm. So what it is today, it might not be in a, a month or in a year. And it's really driven by the people. It comes back to the people, the people who are part of it. Um, getting involved can also be exhausting. And a while back, Delaney mentioned burnout. And I think, you know, Civic Tech is five years in, but this is a really 
uh, important idea to grapple with and say, you know, as a community of volunteers, how do we care for each other? Um, and I know that all of you have many levels of community engagement with different um, folks across silos, and I would be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I've been thinking about care a lot and I think about it often um, and, you know, especially when you're doing volunteer run, I think that there's so much that can be like lost in, in the, you know, the silence, right, of like how people are doing. Um, and for me, I've kind of focused, even for paid work or volunteer work is like what is urgent right and what can just chill out for a sec because i think what this time has kind of showed to folks which i think was something beforehand is that people's anxiety manifests in a lot of different ways right so some folks like love to work a lot right and like they will push through this like moment that they're in and work 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 which means that they'll take more volunteer roles they'll do more and that's how it is right so how do you kind of support that shift of like what people's capacities are compared to some folks who are like you know, disappearing for a little while. And so the ways that we've tried um, to do that is like, you know, we ask in our, in our meetings is like, how, what are the ways that you're cultivating joy, right? Like is a big question I ask all the time is how are you cultivating joy? And um, if you need to take a break, just take the break. Like that's the big piece is like, and like, you know, for how we're able to show respect to each other and care to each other through this time is also just like notifying people, right? Just being like, hey, you know, how do you remove the Shame from saying, hey, I need a breather. And how you do that is by practicing it yourself <laughs> also, right? Is like knowing when you need to take that moment and when you need to take that breather, which I take breathers all the time and practice that quite often, which has made it really difficult for me to do um, a lot more volunteer work, um, you know, personally. But it was important for me if we're not showing up for ourselves as much as we possibly can, then we cannot show up for others and practicing that. And so, yeah, like, how are you cultivating joy and practicing you, in yourself when you need to take a break um, and how do you share that in a way that's, you know, because I think that's the big thing is like if you're able to share that, then whatever is left in the work, it will happen as it needs to happen and trusting that you're working with the right people, whether you're volunteering with them, whether you're working with them, you're in community with them, right? So you're trusting that everyone can kind of hold the space as much as they possibly can. Um, and also, you know, there's a really good Lastly, there's a really good resource. Um, Mia Mingus and a couple of others have really good work around pod mapping, which kind of asks really good questions about, <laughs> about how you care for people in your pod. So for your pod, it's like people who are like the closest to you, um, you know, chosen otherwise, like, you know, and how you take care of each other. So I've also been able to use some of the questions that are brought in like the pod mapping tools to like broader conversations with volunteers, broader conversations um went in communities that I'm not necessarily like in other communities that are not necessarily like my pod but important to have those questions about care um, because it, it becomes very very difficult to kind of maneuver through spaces when you might not know how people's anxiety manifests or you might not know what they're going through and you don't have to know everything obviously but it does kind of help in that so definitely check that out and like learn um, you can learn a lot more in the disability justice movement about like how care manifests um and how you can kind of practice that as much as possible in your work too so me and Mingus pod mapping i'll add it to the chat i'll add another resource i've been learning a lot from the nap ministry you can find them on instagram at the nap ministry it was created by trisha hershey in 2016 and it's a real pushback to the idea of hustle culture and she and the team believe that rest is a form of resistance and reparation for black folks. And there's just lots of great stuff and learning there. And, and I, I think we have to examine ourselves and, and, and why we push ourselves to the, the point of, of, of burnout and really work in uh, rest and, and, and naps and, and boundaries in our work to make it sustainable. Absolutely, thanks. Jelena, anything you wanted to add? Uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Nasma said so much that's, uh, you know, that captures like what's in my head in a more articulate way. But uh, I, the one piece that I'll add is I feel like, you know, burnout is not just, you know, physical labor and the amount of things that we do, but also like the, the emotional labor of, you know, experiencing either like failure or, um, you know, just feeling like 
uh, you're you're not uh, included in a community. Uh, I don't really feel like that um, the community the community that's here, so the civic tech community, um, is uh, guilty of that as much as in other areas. But and I and I really do appreciate within the civic tech community, uh, even people just ha that have reached out and said, "Hey, are you doing okay?" Like that that to me can like go so far in making a difference. Um, you know, and and you know, addressing some of the emotional burdens of uh, doing a project or contributing your volunteer efforts uh, to civic tech and, and to say, hey, this is, you know, great job and having recognition. I think those are just small ways that we can, you know, all support each other in the civic tech community. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I'm also going to throw a question back to everyone in the chat and say, please, tap locks. Uh, let us know what you want to see more of in the civic tech community. Uh, more naps, I think is a great idea, maybe not on Tuesday nights, but at some point in the week to balance out this frenetic activity, I will definitely be ready for a nap. Um, and while that is coming up, I'm also gonna invite the panelists, if you have questions to ask of each other, I think so far so many ideas have surfaced. And I don't know if any of you kind of want to hear more. Yeah, sure. I have a question for Nesma. I'm, I'm curious in regards to the digital justice space, because uh, you're one of the few people I know uh, really using the term and I think inviting people into that discussion on um, like, what are the trends right now or what are the conversations taking place? Like, are you, are you seeing pick up with that idea? Yeah, I think that we are seeing pickup of that idea in regards to the, yeah, like what we view as justice in relation to the tech ecosystem. So like how, how do we have like the core conversations that are often not tied to the technology? Mm -hmm. And I think that that, like people have been talking a lot more about digital rights and all of those pieces, you know, surveillance, et cetera. So I definitely think that the conversation has expanded in the Canadian context. And I also think it provided, I think a lot of actually civic tech projects were actually under the concept of like digital justice, right? Like we're already, you know, in that intro, I say digital justice, but I feel like there's so many terminologies around digital rights. There's just like a, like a little bit of a, like a little window of like space um, and uh, I think that a lot of folks were already working in that environment and maybe didn't have like the language that like especially from Detroit and so I would say yeah I think that there is a lot of folks in the last couple of years who have really expanded and engaged with the conversation which at the end of the day is like deeply rooted in the other issues that we're dealing with environmental economic etc um, and not avoiding those topics right like like I think that has been like a large part of my work is like hey like yes we talked about the tech piece but we got to talk about like this other layer and often I use tech as a Trojan horse for the other things that I care about, to be honest. Um, and I think that the trends that we're seeing in the Canadian context um, is, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think Canada wants to, like you're talking about federally, Canada wants to be a leader on the digital side of things. And so they're definitely pushing on that front. But, you know, this is where, once again, DJL, like we're in this process right now of slowness as a means of doing like so much documentation from the last two years and like all the stuff that we like you know shoulda woulda coulda done and like just did not have the capacity to do and in that really trying to figure out if advocacy is the role moving forward right because i think that's the hard part is that even if the understanding and the language and the analysis is like there the advocacy is not in the large in, in a large scale so there's a lot of things happening and i'm not gonna talk about all of them right now but there's lots of things happening federally provincially and locally that like if i was to actually talk about it's quite terrifying and <laughs> Um, and, you know, there's going to be a need for a lot of pushback. Um, and there is a lot of amazing pushback happening, obviously, with internal staff. But I think, and I'm talking, by the way, political, like, you know, in our public sphere. And um, figuring out what's the step moving forward, right? Because I think that the language is there, but I still think it, it hasn't, there's still a lot more, like, specific advocacy that needs to be done and not on this not only on the scary stuff right um also on the stuff that is like just a waste of money which is like another conversation in itself so um so we we're thinking about that a lot so there might be we might be doing i'm not going to say that out I, I just realized this is being recorded so if we don't do advocacy oh my bad but we're trying to figure it out <laughs> appreciate the honesty yeah 
I think the question of language is really important in terms of like developing a way to articulate shared experiences. And yeah, that is something that has definitely grown rapidly, definitely since I became involved with Civic Tech three years ago. Um, we're approaching time. So I am going to ask another perhaps final question to our panelists, unless the chat explodes and other really urgent uh, questions are asked there. Um, but I also want to explore sort of um, what aspects of Civic Tech Toronto bring you energy in uh, scary and, you know, exhausting moments. <laughs> I, I can just quickly answer. I think what brings me energy is the people, to be honest. I think that's been the really cool part um, about engaging with, you know, Civic Tech Toronto in the last like two years. I think it's just seeing the amazing people that participate, um, that hold space, that are organizers, people who are old organizers. Um, I think that that's been, that's I think what brings me a lot of energy uh, in what's possible and what's, and what we can do moving forward. Uh, because I think that civic tech, I don't know, as a, as a term, I don't know, term, field, whatever you want to call it, has shifted a lot in the last several years. And I think, you know, as shifted, been co-opted at all the different shifts that have occurred, um, the people are like the most important part of how, of what it could also be moving forward, right? And like what you want it to be moving forward. And so um, people, I think, has been an important part. Thanks, Catherine. I would say the connections, which is based on people. I mean, I just went into gallery view and scrolling through, there are so many people who I met because of Civic Tech Toronto or in a shared space. We've stayed in touch and I'm up to speed what you're all working on, on thanks to you know Twitter and um, just again, a commitment to this, to this work. It can be really hard to meet new people in a big city. Like that's not an easy thing to do, right? Most people make their friends at school or at, at work or through family. And this is a space where a lot of us showed up not knowing many people. Many of you showed up not knowing anyone. And to be able to look at this reunion tonight and say, wow, these are my people, these are my friends, that's really special. Mm -hmm. I also agree, it's, I think it's people, but I think it's a specific kind of people because I, I feel definitely more engaged in civic tech than I do in some of than uh, compared to some of the other activities. And I feel like really what it comes down to is uh, we're with a group of people that are mission oriented. And that's something that really, uh, you know, resonates with me. And for, for other people that, you know, that, that resonates with, the, with that, you know, it, I think people can find a shared experience in that. Um, so, you know, it really comes down to, like, I don't think civic tech could be civic tech if we remove all of us that are here today. Um, it would not really exist as, uh, you know, anything else because there really isn't, there really isn't uh, like a charter or, uh, you know, any, it's not an institution, it's a community. And I think a community consists of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say lastly, just quickly about like the energy part is that, you know, I think it's also a place to ask like hard questions as well. And I think that people are always down to have that conversation, like what's happening in the chat right now, like down to have that conversation in a way that still holds space for respect and care, which I think is important, right? Because we should always keep room or have room for difficult conversations. It's not necessarily who, you know, um, and be able to expand in whatever direction we need to. And I think that having those having a space for that is important and it's important um especially as you know we think of as as the city thinks of technology as like the next frontier as well right i think that's also important for us to create the space for the critical questions here definitely thank you i think these are strong uh notes to end on and i already see the applause emoji starting to uh appear in my zoom window um so i just want to thank all of the speakers for sharing their thoughts and their really ongoing um, engagement with Civitech, whatever that means to each of us, um, with their 
uh, questions and comments tonight. But I also want to thank uh, the audience that this wouldn't be a birthday party without a crowd. And um, everyone is making that feeling of celebration possible. Back when we asked, you know, how would you describe Civic Tech Toronto in one word? A few of the all caps responses were pizza and samosas. So I don't have all caps cake. We can't do that virtually, but we're doing something that's almost as good as slicing up a slab cake. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna flip it back to Curtis and just thanks again. Wow. That was just an incredible panel um, and an incredible chat. I can't wait to watch the recording, read the transcript, maybe correct it a little bit um, and uh, look through the chat again. Um, just before we get on to anything, I would love to, um, I would love to just unmute everybody in the chat right now. And if you wanna, I don't know if this will break soon, but if I unmute everybody and we all give a real round of applause, I wanna see what happens. Uh, maybe have your, get ready on the volume, but. Zoom servers explode. <laughs> All right, now you're back muted again. Thank you, everyone. I did, it went pretty well, actually. It seemed like a bunch of people got their different times of brief applause. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen right now so I can tell you that I will be ceasing the recording. Oh, no, first I have to find it because now it's kind of lost itself on me again. I'm not used, to, sorry everyone, I'm not used to. There we go, stop it.